So I came across this uh, really cool app the other day that helps put yourself in the picture. And so um, here I am with uh, President Trump, um, you know, uh, holding each other's hands. You know, you might have a tight grip there. We were kind of like, <laughs> you know, I guess presumably doing that kind of arm wrestle thing that happens. Um, here I am with this uh, great white. Apparently it was quite scary, but I look pretty, pretty calm. Uh, there with that great white behind me. And then, you know, Bono is like my all, you know, big fan of Bono. So we hung out <laughs> apparently for, for the weekend, just, just him and me. And then, um, and then visiting the Great Wall of China. I thought that was like a, meant to be a great time as well. Um, so, you know, it, the app says, says this. Simply take a photo or upload one of your own and using the super easy to use interface, draw an area where you like to crop then simply crop and position however you wish on your chosen background. Resize and rescale on the fly. It's really that easy. Marketing for the app said, quote, it will put me firmly in the picture in many situations. But of course, there's one big problem, right? I wasn't really there. Uh, and despite, you know, how badly cropped my picture is, you know, I can't even pretend to be there. I, I don't experience any of these things. But, but I wonder if the same thing might be true about many followers of Jesus today. You see, I meet lots of Christians who, who watch others live the adventure of following Jesus. They, they see others connecting in deep friendships, laughing at, at people who just kind of get them. Uh, they see others floating on cloud nine because of the way they, they helped a family out of debt or were part of a marriage that was rescued or a life that was transformed. And, and it's like, like so many followers of Jesus can kind of, kind of watch the, the, the pictures and lives of others, but they're not in the, the frame themselves. It's easy to watch endless pictures of others enjoying deep connections, the smiles, the laughter, the honor sharing. And, and at a distance, it's so easy to see the difference these other people can make in the, the lives of a child overseas, the school that's transformed, the, the toxic workplace that's changed. Uh, we can even open Scripture and, and read about these, these uh, women and men that God used to, to, to just do all of these faith adventures. But so often all these things are at this, this safe distance away from the action. But you see, you and I weren't created to watch the endless pictures of the adventures of others. We weren't created even just to, to read these Bible stories about something that happened in the past. These things were made for us to be right in the very frame of where God is most active, right in the picture ourselves. So today and over the next couple of Sundays, I want to talk about what it means to put yourself in the picture, where God is working to renew people and places. So each Sunday, today and the next couple of Sundays, we're going to reflect on three key words that have to be core in our lives and core in our practice if we're going to actually put ourselves in that frame. So today's word is this word, belong. When I just kind of see that word or hear that word, there's kind of a, a leaning into it for me because it's just such a, a warm word. We, I, I think we all have this, this yearning to belong. We dream of these deep connections. In my Tereo studies last year, I came across this wonderful uh, Māori word uh, for belonging. It's uh, whanau natanga. Translated, it has the idea of relationship and kinship, a, a sense of family connection a relationship through these shared experiences and, and working together, which provides people with a sense of belonging. Develops as a result of, of kinship rights and obligations, which also serve to strengthen each member of the kin group, but also extends to others to whom one develops a close familial friendship or reciprocal relationship. You see, that, that's, that's actually the concept in, in the Bible. And so today, I, I want us to explore what it is to, to belong. And so I've got four questions I want to ask and answer today. Uh, first of all, where does this yearning to belong actually come from? You know, why is it so important to us anyway? And the next question, you know, why is it so hard to belong? Because the yearning to belong is one thing, but why is it so stinking hard to kind of get there? Uh, and then third question, is, it, uh, is there any hope that we can actually develop a deep sense of belonging in today's crazy, confusing world? And then if so, how do we actually go about belonging? So let me start with the first question. Where does this yearning to belong actually come from? And the answer to that, you just go right back to the very beginning of the Bible, very first page, chapter one of Genesis, and we read about a God 
who is a relational God who intrinsically belongs himself. Do read about this? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. So God speaks and this, this word goes out and accomplishes something. God says, let there be light, and then there is light, that this word accomplishes and brings light. And then if you look across to John's gospel, and right at the beginning, John, having read Genesis 1, you know, notes this. He says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. And so the word became human and made his home among us. This means that Jesus was involved in the creation process. So right at the very beginning of creation, we we suddenly see these three persons relating to each other. Verse 1, God the Father. Verse 2, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Verse 3, the Word, that's Jesus. You see, the Bible reveals God as this this triune being. Christians use a term for a trinity. And throughout the Bible, we see how these, these persons relate to each other. So I mentioned this before. Early church leaders came up with a, a word to describe that. It's perichoresis. Sounds really sophisticated because it's a Greek term, and the reason it's a Greek word is that was the common language they spoke at the time. But perichoresis just speaks about how Father, Son, Spirit are so, so bound together in this, this beautiful relationship where the life of each flows into the other. The thoughts and experiences flow into the other. Jesus describes it this way, the Father is in me and I in the Father. This delightful, loving, self-giving, interrelationship of each person and the Godhead for the other. So think about this. You know, right at the very beginning, before even creation, each divine person plays his particular role with the other persons. We have this God who intrinsically knows what it is to belong because he is a community being. But then something else happens. This relational God makes people in his own relational image. So you come to the end of chapter one. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. So human beings are created in the image of God. Because God is a community being, we are community beings. Each member of the Godhead has this deep sense of belonging, and so we also have this yearning to belong. Which kind of explains to me why, like reality TV, which seems like, why would anybody do that? At the same time, we kind of, we we want to, because at least for a half an hour or so, we we feel somewhat connected to these these characters, albeit superficially. We, We want to connect. And here in chapter 2 of Genesis, we see the, the process God goes through in, into creating the very first people. He makes this garden called Eden, which means something like uh, delight or a or, or place of bliss. He takes Adam and he brings all the animals there. And, but then God says, eh, something's not good. Something's not the way it's meant to be. And right at this point in, in the Genesis story, God is always Uh, said something, and it's always been good, it's been good, it's been good, it's been very good. But now, even though Adam is in this beautiful garden with all these animals, God says something's not good. And it kind of forces you to stop and go, what's not good? Because look at where he is. And God says it's not good for the man to be alone. You see, God made Adam, made all of us to be these relational people, just like himself. You know, often I hear people say to me something like, all we need is God. And yet even God in the story, even though God and Adam are like, you know, hanging out in the garden, God says it's not good that Adam would not have any other human beings to relate with. And so God makes Eve, and they come into the garden together, and chapter two finishes, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And the writer's not trying to tell us something about clothing or the lack thereof. No, this is, this is a picture of vulnerability, of trust, no walls, there's, there's no barriers, there's no pretense, but there's complete trust, a sense of belonging. So right at the very beginning, we see this, this God who is a, a relational God who intrinsically belongs himself, 
and this relational God who makes people in His relational image. And that exactly is why every single one of us has this yearning now to belong. And yet we know that there's a gap between that yearning and between the reality, isn't it, of what we so often experience. I wonder if this picture here captures more about what we're experiencing now. You know, most of culture is just kind of this, this selfie. Rather than the we, we've thought about me. And it's, it's me in the picture. And then I, I put up this emoji to kind of describe something. And it may not actually even be how I'm feeling, but I, that's what I want to portray to people around me. And, and it's just this, it's kind of what we now start to see as, as friendship. Very different to what we see here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So what happened? That second question. Why is it so hard now to belong? Well, Genesis 3 tells us about the four, what theologians refer to as the four, that Adam and Eve both ate fruit from a tree outside of what God had told them not to eat from. They effectively reached for a promise of a life outside of what God had prescribed for them. They're not content anymore to just trust the goodness and the promises of God. They want to find kind of happiness and life and identity outside of what God has set for them. And as a result, you know, there's all these consequences. And we can relate because we find ourselves in that kind of same story too, don't we? we? We seek to find our identity in things other than what God says for us and our stuff and our work and our activities. Uh, we're not content to listen to God anymore or, or, or obey God. We, we want to find happiness ourselves into the voices around us. And when we do, we do what Adam and Eve did, and there's noticeable consequences. And when you look at Genesis 3, the very first effect of that poor decision is damaged relationships. As soon as they turn their backs on God and make decisions against what God said, there's this shame and there is this distance in their own human relationships. Now, the very first consequence isn't, isn't kind of murder or robbing a bank, though kind of murder happens in the very next chapter. It's just that they no longer feel like they belong. And so at the end of chapter 3, it says the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They no longer feel like they can trust each other. You see, this is why marriages and friendships break down. It's why two people who once loved each other or respected each other can turn their backs on each other and now wound and attack and blame each other. Now, when you have strain in a relationship, it's as old as the tree. You know, I can't let you see me for who I really am because you might judge me or you might kind of push me away. Or we say, how are you? We're fine. How are you? Fine. We put this kind of emoji on when deep down we're, we're really struggling. We're really struggling. You know, these are our own fig leaves that we tend to find ourselves. You see, somewhere in our DNA, we have this, this yearning to belong. But somewhere else, there's also this, this brokenness and this pain. And instead of moving to the we, we move to the, to the me. And because we have this yearning to belong, we still search for it. But often it just leads to these, to these pseudo-friendships. In fact, now this might be the formula for most friendships around us, that we should start to believe Facebook friends are greater than real friends. You know, the average person now has 338 Facebook friends. But are they really your friends? You know, recent studies indicate that only 4.1% of your Facebook friends are dependable. 13... <laughs> oh, nobody's hurt. That's good. We can carry on. 13.6% uh, might express sympathy in an emotional crisis. They're not friends. You know, I mean, we might call them friends, but it's like shallow friends. I, I think of it like, like veneer. You know, veneer is that, you know, a millimeter thick, you know, so-called wood that kind of covers something cheap or nasty. Veneer might look like the real thing. It might look like real wood, but it's, it's shallow. It's, it's just cheap. It might look good at a glance, but it's just cheap imitation. R real, real timber is, is solid. R real timber, when you look at the trunk, it has these, these rings around it that tell stories from all these seasons of life. Real, real friendships have that kind of solid character to it that have been formed through, through different things that have gone on. It's not some kind of veneer, surface-level stuff. But it's hard, isn't it? So question three, 
Is there any hope that we can continually feel a, a deep sense of belonging? You know, the real timber of, of friendship, even in today's fast and confusing world. And I want to say absolutely we can. Absolutely we can feel like we belong. And the reason I can say that is because the rest of the Bible story is ultimately about, about God's plan for the world to once again belong. You see, the gospel is this relational story about a God who, who took the initiative to break down all the walls that we put up and that exist between us and every other person. And he brings us into relationship with himself where we have the sense of belonging and, 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 and with him, but then he also brings us into church where we have this relationship with others and we can actually be in a belonging community. The power of the gospel moves us from me to think we. And you know, the story, the way he did this was by sending Jesus. So over Christmas, we celebrated the coming of Emmanuel, that, that God is with us, that, that Jesus left eternity past and he actually came into our world to do all that was necessary to put himself in the picture and bring us into the family of God. The very beginning of our very end of Jesus' life, just before he's killed, the very night he's arrested, uh, he prays a prayer. And often at the end of somebody's life, you know, it's, it's kind of their, their values and the things that are most important to them tend to, tend to be expressed. This is what Jesus prays. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who would believe in me through their message. So that's like us today. And he says, I'm praying that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world would believe that you sent me. Do you hear what he's praying? Jesus' prayer for us and for other followers of Jesus is that we would experience this deep sense of belonging in our relationships with each other, just as Jesus experiences this dynamic perichoresis with his Father, this, this, this mutual life-giving thing that happens. And apparently this, this beautiful dynamic that can exist in belonging is so magnetic that others would yearn to come into that because they also want to belong. Certainly one of the reasons why the early church grew so rapidly. You can read um, Acts Through the Week, and I've been reading this book called 30 Years That Changed the World by Michael Green, just looking at the book of Acts. And, and he says, the first thing that strikes me about church life in Acts is its vitality. It seems to have been white hot for many of them most of the time. And, and that way is expressed in the sharing of possessions the unity of purpose, their mutual encouragement, the, the, the way they practically care for anyone in need, their corporate praise, their fervent prayer, their, their sensitivity and openness to the Holy Spirit, their concern for teaching, for being equipped, their respect for leadership, the way they have each other's backs, he says. He, he looks at the way churches have been, all of these early churches were so diverse from each other. You know, there was uh, social diversity, there was ethnic diversity, I mean, much like ours, and he says they overcame bitterness and prejudice and hurt. And why did this happen? Because they realized the power of the gospel smashes through the formal and informal apartheids we so often create. That even amidst strong differences, unity was important to them. There was a genuine sense that this is the place they can belong, that they can belong. One Christian author uh, writes this, I love it. The church is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common sense, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because they are all being saved by Jesus Christ and owe Him a common allegiance. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. You see, that, that's why there's moments where we will be hurt and we will hurt each other. Early, early church had moments where they struggled as well because it's hard work to belong. It's possible, but it's hard work. I mean, even um, the communion we took earlier probably is a, is a picture of that. It can get a little chaotic, a little messy. But what brings us together is is actually the work of Jesus, where you can actually be family with people who are so different from you. See, I want you to hear that it's very possible to have a deep sense of belonging. 
but it will take hard work. You, you shouldn't ex expect to feel like you can belong without making sacrifices needed in order to belong. And that shouldn't surprise us, because again, the, the, the way we belong was through the death and resurrection of, of Jesus, through the sacrifices He made, that He left eternity, left heaven to step into the picture Himself so that we can also step into that and have that sense of belonging. You see, I meet way too many Christians today who, who, who want to live the adventures of, of following Jesus. They want to be connected in deep friendships, laughing with, with, with others who, who get them for who they are. They, they want to be part of that. Or they see the way others have, have people pray for them and support them in their struggles at university or, or school and, and work or, or aging. They want to be part of that. But they don't make the moves necessary for that to happen. Or, or they wish they could open up their lives and kind of adopt uh, children or, or grandchildren, uh, even here in the church, that would kind of see them as, as grandparents or pseudo-aunties and uncles. Because they see people belonging. They see those deep connections. But at times I'll hear them complaining, you know, I don't belong. It's hard to belong. But they've never done what's necessary to, to put themselves in the picture to belong. So you and I weren't created to watch the pictures of others. We were made to be right in the center of the action ourselves. So final question, how do we belong? Because let's face it, we're all at different starting points, aren't we? So as I was thinking about it this week, I, I jotted down four moves that we need to make here at GCC. And, and my hope today is that every single one of us will make a move, at least one move. The first move is this a move from anonymity to being known. See, so some of you are here today, and you've been, it might be new today, or you might have been coming for some time, but you, you try to stay anonymous. You, you might come to a service, and they kind of dart out the door, and you don't want to write anything down. And I, I get that you might be checking us out uh, to see whether this will be your church home. I realize some of you have been hurt before from, from past environments, and, and so you're a little guarded. You might just want to keep a low profile for a season. A lot of wisdom sometimes in that. I get that. But you can't stay anonymous. There comes a point where you, you have to make yourself known. I was looking at some studies this week about how, how lonely people can be. You know, in a period of four weeks in August last year when the study was done, it discovered that there were 650,000 Kiwis who felt lonely. The top of the list were those between ages 15 and 24, followed by people 80 and above. And according to international research, being lonely is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which apparently is pretty bad. You see, modern life, even though we're surrounded in this big city of all these people, we can feel so lonely. We desperately need to belong. So here at GCC, I want you to know there's a place for you. There's a place around our table. And we would be delighted if you went from like visitor status to, to family status today. And if you're kind of in that place, if you're ready to move from anonymity to be known, uh, action for you today is probably just at the end of the service, grab one of our uh, forms, fill it in as a way of saying, I'm making myself known today. And during the week, we will give you a call and talk about what that looks like. That's the first basic move, isn't it? There's another move I want to encourage some of you to make today. It's a move from disconnected to connected. See, a whole bunch of you have kind of filled in a form, you kind of get our church email, you, you come to services like this one, but you still feel disconnected. So how do you kind of connect in a, in a large church like this one? Well, I think there's two prime ways that you can connect. One way is by joining a team. And you can join a team and serve in a whole bunch of different ways. There's things through the week with, with cap groups and budgeting classes and job clubs and English classes and rest home visits, mainly music groups, administration help, creative arts, Friday night youth group. On Sundays, there's host teams and car parking teams and worship teams and next generation ministries. The list just goes on and on. And I don't want to go through all the, the details today. I'd rather give you an opportunity where you give us your contact details and we personalize it rather than kind of slot people in, where we kind of talk about what's on your heart and we allow you to just join a team and try something for a while. There's going to be a phone number coming up here on the screen. It's going to be up there for a minute or so. 
I, I just encourage you to get, get your phone out. And if that's where you're at today, if you want to join a team, that you would just text your name to that number. We'll give you a call this week to kind of unpack that a bit more. Another way you can connect is through our groups. A whole bunch of groups here. There's ethnic groups uh, specific to different languages. There's home groups that meet all around the city. There's study groups. There's interest and cause groups. There's Alpha that meets on Tuesday nights beginning Tuesday week. And if you're interested in joining any of these groups, again, just, just text your name to that number and we'll give you a call this week and kind of unpack some of that with you. It might be that you can just commit to a group for these, these 10 weeks as a way of just getting a feel of what that's like. Uh, if you have kids and you need a babysitter, we will reimburse you for the costs of a babysitter because we are committed to getting you in a group. In fact, some of you um, have kind of formed your own groups, which I think is brilliant. Uh, if you would like to get resources from the church or encouragement from the church, again, just, just text us and we'll be able to kind of put you on a list to be able to get some of that to you. If you don't have a phone with you, just chat to Debbie at the information desk afterwards. She'll jot your name down. We'll give you a call from there. There's a third move you can make. It's a move from me to we. You see, it's one thing to create space and time to be around people, but that could actually be quite different to being committed to people. See, some of you here, a great deal of you are already connected to a group, but if you're honest, you don't actually feel like you belong. You see, that's because just doing the task doesn't necessarily do a whole lot. A while back, I came across this research from Princeton professor Robert Worthno. He says, small groups provide occasion for individuals to focus on themselves in the presence of others, or can do. The social contract binding members together asserts only the weakest of obligation. Come if you have time, talk if you feel like it, respect everyone's opinion, never criticize, leave quietly if you become dissatisfied. In other words, you can be surrounded by people, but you're not doing what's necessary to belong. In fact, a couple of Boston psychiatrists say uh, groups fail to re or can fail to replicate the sense of belonging we've lost. Attending weekly meetings, just dropping in and out as one pleases, shopping around for a more satisfactory or appealing group. All of these factors work against the growth of true community, of, of belonging. So I'm a big fan of groups, but you see, groups in and of themselves won't provide the sense of belonging. Belonging comes as we move from me to a focus on we. And we actually start to carve out time for each other. Uh, there are no microwave friendships. You, you can't do friendship in a hurry, but you linger with people and you, and you weep with them when they're hurt and you, you, and you rejoice with them when they're celebrating. And if we're going to develop a sense of belonging here, we, we need to change the way we're currently living. Psychologist Alan McGuinness notes that rule number one for entering into deep friendship sounds deceptively simple. Simply this, assign top priority to your relationships. But we tend to do that with work and money and all that kind of thing. We actually need to carve our time for people, for friends, and change how we're living in order to move from me to we. And sometimes if you go to a small group, it will feel like a discipline. And that's actually because it is. Sometimes it will feel like a chore. And that's sometimes the way we feel. But it's about actually being committed to a group of people week in, week out, continuing to journey with people and opening up our lives to others. This is what moving from me to we looks like. One final movement. A move from guest to host. You know, it's very important to us here at GCC that all of our environments embody the values on the wall that they're inclusive, they're hospitable, all of these things. And perhaps it's time for you to say today, you know, I'm not going to, to think of myself as a guest anymore. I'm going to step in and actually be a host to others, whether that's formally joining a host team or just informally making others here feel welcome. Brilliant. In fact, in January 2018, United Kingdom's Prime Minister, Theresa May, appointed, I don't know if you saw this, a Minister of Loneliness to tackle the social and health issues caused by social isolation. Uh, in her press release, she said this, for far too many people, loneliness is the sad reality of modern life. I wanna confront this challenge for our society, for all of us to take action to address the loneliness endured by the elderly, by carers, by those who have lost loved ones, people who have no one to talk to or share their thoughts and experiences with. 
was reading that earlier in the week and thought, you know, I, I reckon we need to have like a few hundred people who are ministers of loneliness around our city. Our age concern, CEO, Stephanie Clare says, research has been done into the effects of loneliness on our health, and we know it can have a huge impact. It can shorten your life, and in some cases make it unpleasant, sort of feel like it's not worth living. And that's not something you can take or cure by a couple of tablets or by a trip to the doctor. So a whole bunch of you, that might be the move you need to make today. We just say, I'm going to move from guest to host. I'm, I'm going to make sure I, I, I get involved in being a minister of loneliness here at church or in our city. I'm going to be involved in retirement villages, visiting you know, a team that does that, or, or helping young people just to be a supportive voice to them. A whole bunch of ways that you can think of. Uh, next week, we'll have our cafe back open again. And uh, you know we're looking for, for hosts and people involved in, in that space just to provide good hospitality where people can come, come together and just enjoy community with each other. Or if you're sitting next to someone and you find that they're new, uh, don't just say hi, but even help them get to the information desk and, and go get them a coffee and talk about uh, who we are here at GCC. Invite each other for a meal. Make space in our homes for people. You see, it's not enough to just look at the pictures of others. You can think about people who are enjoying friendship and go, oh, I just wish I was part of that. But you need to move towards it. Or you go, I, I just wish I was part of that. But you, you need to make the moves yourself. You need to put yourself in the picture. So what are the moves you're going to make today? Is it a move from anonymity to being known? Well, if so, move from visitor status to family status today. Is it a move from being disconnected to being connected? Well, if so, join a team or get connected in a group today. Or a move from me to thinking we. You know, assigning top priority to your relationships. Or a move from guest to host, where you become this informal minister of loneliness in our church and in our city. Because the people who actually put themselves in the picture are the people who live the adventure of following Jesus. They're the people who experience a deep sense of belonging. What if we can stand together as we pray? Uh, Jesus, together we want to thank you that as we speak to you, we're talking to a God, Father, Son, Spirit, who is completely relational. Thank you that you make us in your image as these relational beings. But would you help us now to take the steps we need to take in order to belong and community with each other. We declare today, oh God, that we are forgiven, that we are healed, that we are restored, that we are brought out of the darkness into your glorious light, that you, oh God, by the power of the gospel have brought us into family, into a body of people. We've been grafted together into the vine. We're part of your temple. That is better together than individually. So we worship you as we finish up this morning, just declaring who we are, O oh God, and declaring who you are. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, God, that we're part of a vibrant, diverse community of people. Thank you, O oh God. Amen.